If you know anything about the history of railways, you've probably heard of the Rocket, the locomotive built by George and Robert Stevenson that won the Rainhill Trials and advanced the steam locomotive from a lumbering piece of industrial plant to the machine that would reshape the world. This video is not about the Rocket, although I did make a three-part video on the Rocket which I will link below. No, this is about the engine that we might call the runner-up, Timothy Hackworth's Saint Paray. Timothy Hackworth was, in his day, one of the greatest locomotive engineers around, if not THE greatest. He was born in 1786 at Wylam, coincidentally the same Northumberland village as George Stevenson. Also like Stevenson, he gained his experience working in the smithy at a colliery, in this case Wylam Colliery, taking over the position of the mine's mechanical engineer from his late father who had taught him everything he knew. Wylam Colliery was an early adopter of steam haulage, so Hackworth was soon very knowledgeable on the subject. Unfortunately for the colliery, but fortunately for the Industrial Revolution, Hackworth was a man of faith, a strict Methodist who would not work Sundays. When the colliery demanded that he do so, he walked out, and found a temporary position at Robert Stevenson and Company in 1824. Yes, that Robert Stevenson. In fact, he was essentially filling in for both George and Robert, who were both occupied elsewhere. George in civil engineering projects, Robert in the mines of Columbia. Despite coming from an ostensibly similar background, George and Timothy had very different approaches to engineering. Timothy had stayed in school until the age of 14 and had a strong interest in the theoretical side of things. The combination of his father's tutelage, his academic knowledge, and his hands-on experience would serve him well. In 1825, George recommended him to the Stockton and Darlington Railway. The Stockton and Darlington Railway was the first public railway to use steam locomotives. The early locomotives were manufactured by Stevenson's, and, well, they weren't great. The first was locomotion, and it was followed by the similar Hope, Black Diamond, and Diligence. In 1826, they bought a fifth locomotive from a Newcastle engineer named Robert Smith. This engine was known as Chitterprat, possibly because of the sound it made, and it was even worse than the others. By some accounts, the Stockton and Darlington's directors were getting fed up with this steam malarkey, and considering reverting to horsepower. Hackworth was having none of it, though, and in 1827 declared to the directors, Gentlemen, if you will allow me to make you an engine in my own way, I will engage that it shall answer your purpose. By this time he had his own workshop at Shildon, where he took the disgraced Chitterprat and rebuilt it completely. The result was a far more efficient locomotive, now named Royal George. Royal George was a six-wheeled locomotive compared to Chitterprat's four wheels. It incorporated a number of features that would become standard on Hackworth's engines, and indeed all engines as the technology evolved. If you look at locomotion, you'll see that it has a chimney at one end and a fire at the other. There's a single flue running from the fire to the chimney, and that's what heats the water and generates the steam. It's much like the heating element in an electric kettle. Royal George and saint Perret have the fire and the chimney at the same end. That's because the fire doubles back on itself, doubling the amount of heating area and increasing efficiency. For this reason, it's known as a return flue boiler. This type of boiler would be superseded by multi-tube boilers, like the one on Rocket, but at the time this was a great improvement on what had gone before. The Royal George also pioneered Hackworth's blast pipe. A blast pipe directs the exhaust steam from the cylinders up the chimney. This, in turn, draws air through the flue, causing the fire to burn better. Now, there's some debate over who actually invented this, but if Hackworth didn't invent it, he perfected the idea, and it became a standard feature on future steam locomotives. And one last feature of note is the sprung safety valve. The safety valve releases excess steam from the boiler when the pressure gets too high. Early locomotives simply used a weight to hold the valve down, but this had a number of disadvantages. If the track was bumpy, which it often was, the valve might be jogged open and cause the engine to lose steam it was actually using. And it was easy to tamper with. Some drivers deliberately weighed the valve down to essentially overclock their engines with literally explosive results. Hackworth added a spring to the Royal George's valve, which kept it closed until needed and was much harder to tamper with. This, too, became standard on locomotives. 
Altogether, the Royal George was the best locomotive in the world in 1828, but a year later it would be obsolete. On the other side of the country, a new railway was being developed, from the port of Liverpool to the manufacturing city of Manchester. The Liverpool and Manchester Railway were trying to decide how to power their line. Should they use locomotives or stationary engines hauling the trains by rope? The company commissioned the engineers, John Rastrick and James Walker, to survey the state of locomotives, and they determined that locomotives just weren't worth the hassle. Robert Stevenson had just returned from South America and went on the defensive. Hackworth was more than willing to assist his former employer with statistics and scientific evidence to show that locomotives were cheaper, more advanced, more flexible, and more efficient. He suggested in his letter to Stevenson that the Liverpool and Manchester Railway had, in his words, strangled themselves with ropes. The report Stevenson produced persuaded the directors of the railway to give steam locomotives a trial. Literally. Walker and Rastrick had proposed a trial to find the best locomotive around to be held at Rainhill. All sorts of proposals were put forward by dozens of engineers and inventors. Engines powered by water pressure, by mercury, even by perpetual motion. But in the end, only five entrants made it to the competition. Rocket, Cycloped, Perseverance, Novelty, and Sompere. I don't think it's much of a spoiler to say that Rocket won with its build quality and advanced features, but we're not here to talk about Rocket. Much. We're here to talk about the competition. Thomas Brandreth's cycloped was powered by a horse in a treadmill, which meant that, once you took friction into account, it had slightly less than one horsepower. It didn't have a hope. John Hill and Timothy Burstall's Perseverance barely worked at all. The popular favourite to win was Novelty, which, per its name, looked absolutely state-of-the-art. It was compact, with many of its moving parts, plus its water tank and much of its boiler, stowed between the frames. It put on a good show, too, being a nippy machine with rapid acceleration. But if the Stevensons were worried, they didn't show it. George commented, Yon thing's got no guts, upon seeing the bellows break and the whole thing vanish in a cloud of steam. Some Pere, though, was more worrying. The simple fact was, at the end of the 1820s, Hackworth was producing better locomotives than the Stevensons. With the interests of the father and son elsewhere, the company's standards had slipped, and no engineer knew the shortcomings of Stevenson locomotives better than Hackworth. You might say it was his job. In fact, the statistics in Robert Stevenson's report to the directors of the railway showed that Hackworth's locomotives could haul an average of 10 tonnes more. But Hackworth was at a disadvantage. The Stevensons had the resources of the best locomotive works in the world at their disposal. Hackworth had a home workshop, a limited budget, and could only work on his engine in his spare time. Working day and night, he was barely able to get it completed for the competition. The design was essentially a smaller version of Royal George, designed to meet the specifications of the trial rules. These included a weight limit and a requirement that the wheels be sprung, both of which would bring problems. It had the return flue and blast pipe, but was only mounted on four wheels. Many of the parts had been farmed out to other manufacturers, which would result in some controversy during the actual trial. The engine was named Sans Pareil, French for without equal, and was painted green and yellow. There was nothing about the livery in the rules, but it's worth pointing out that Rocket, Novelty, and Sans Pareil went with exciting names and bright colours, emphasising that these were built to compete with stagecoaches, not pit ponies. Sans Pareil was the biggest engine in the trial, and arguably the most conventional. It didn't have the speedy appearance of Novelty or Rocket, and aside from its colour scheme, looked very much like a colliery engine. On the 6th of October, the trials began with a weigh-in, and here, Sompere ran into its first problem. It was found, at four and a half tonnes, to be over the official weight limit. Hackworth had a rebuttal. The weight limit was there to prevent damage to the rails. Hackworth was more than familiar with this problem. It had been one of the first things he had had to deal with at Wylam. The issue wasn't overall weight, but weight distribution. The weight was distributed evenly across four wheels, and therefore, per axle, Sans Pareil was exerting less force on the track than Rocket, which had most of its weight over the two driving wheels. The judges eventually agreed to let Sans Pareil participate. The first day wasn't an official competition, more an introduction to the contenders. 
Novelty impressed the crowds with its turn of speed, and George Stevenson engaged in a lot of showboating with Rocket. Saint Perret was no slouch despite its appearance, but problems were becoming apparent. Hackworth had barely had time to test the engine before sending it to Rainhill. The cylinders gave Saint Perret an odd rocking gait. John Dixon, assistant to the Stevensons, said that it mumbles and roars and rolls about like an empty beer butt on a rough pavement. The springing reduced the power of the cylinders to the wheels, despite Hackworth attempting to use as little springing as he could within the letter of the rules. In fact, Dixon said that he couldn't even see the springs. He ventured the opinion that it should have had six wheels instead of four. And the engine had dreadful fuel economy, thanks to the blast pipe working rather too well. It sent the unburnt fuel right through the boiler and out the funnel. And then... the engine broke down. The problem was a cracked cylinder. Remember how I said that Hackworth had had many of his components built by other manufacturers? Well, the cylinders were by Robert Stevenson and co. Hackworth was convinced of sabotage. Novelty had also broken down, so the second day consisted of rockets showing off while the other competitors were being repaired. More problems became apparent. Saint Perret's boiler, supplied by Bedlington Ironworks, was leaking badly. Hackworth had another disadvantage. The 11th of October was a Sunday. While other competitors were working on their engines, he would not. He had to work right through Monday night, but on Tuesday, Saint Perret was finally ready. It was actually posing a real challenge to Rocket, matching it for speed on seven runs up the test track at a breathtaking 14 miles per hour. But on run number eight, the feed water pump began to malfunction. With no water coming into the boiler, the engine's temperature rose. The fusible plug melted. The fusible plug is a safety feature sitting between the boiler and the firebox. It's a stopper made of a metal that melts at a relatively low temperature. In the case of saint Perret, it was made of lead. When the temperature in the boiler gets too high, the plug melts. Later in the development of steam, the idea was that this would blast steam into the firebox to alert the crew to take action. But in the case of saint Perret, it let water into the firebox and put the fire out bringing the engine to a stop. The plug was replaced, the fire was relit, steam was raised, and the pump failed once more. saint Perret was out for the day. Hackworth spent the rest of the day assisting the novelty team in repairing their engine. The following day was Wednesday the 14th, the final day of the trials. For the first time, Perseverance was in steam and trundled along at approximately walking pace. Novelty broke down again and was withdrawn, Hackworth wanted a final shot, but the judges said no. The engine had been given more than a fair chance. It was overweight, it used twice as much coke as Rocket, and had failed in three different ways. Rocket was declared the winner, as the only engine that had successfully met the conditions of the trial. Hackworth proved to be a sore loser. He blamed the on-site engineers for incompetence, accused the judges of messing up the measurements, disputed the rules, and accused the Stevensons of conspiracy. In the interests of fairness, I should point out that George Stevenson was the engineer who designed the Liverpool and Manchester Railway, so he did have a pre-existing link with the company. In fact, the rocket had hauled the director's train to the trial. But while correspondence by the Stevensons and their staff indicates confidence, it's based on the superiority of their overall design. Yes, there was a flaw in the cylinder, but Hackworth had ordered 20 cylinders, inspected them, and picked out the best. And the Stevensons would surely have expected a thorough inspection. Sabotage seems unlikely. The failures weren't necessarily Hackworth's fault. He didn't build the boiler or cast the cylinders. But the engine's weight and fuel consumption problems were entirely down to him. Ultimately, whether you think he was unlucky, unsportsmanlike, or just produced a bad design, the fact is that saint Perret was the last of the old order. Rocket was simply the better engine. Despite this, the Liverpool and Manchester Railway actually bought saint Perret and then leased it to the Bolton and Lee Railway, selling it to them in 1832. In 1844, it was used as a stationary boiler, providing steam at Coppel Colliery, and then in 1864, it was donated to the Patent Museum and thus preserved for posterity. It's currently at the Locomotion Museum at Shildon, just a few hundred yards from where it was built. At present, it's displayed alongside a working replica built in 1980 for the 150th anniversary of the opening of the Liverpool and Manchester Railway. I find it ironic that there are two identical locomotives called saint Perret.
But this was far from the end of Hackworth's career. Not only was he still the locomotive superintendent of the Stockton and Darlington, but he would also set up his own locomotive manufacturer with his son. He would build Russia's first steam locomotive, and Samson, one of the first engines in Canada. Another of his engines for the Stockton and Darlington Railway, Derwent, is also preserved. He would pass away in 1850 at the age of 63, but it seems that he never quite got over his loss at Rainhill. In 1849, he designed a new locomotive and challenged Robert Stevenson to pit his latest model against it. The name of this engine? saint the II. Well, I hope you enjoyed this unequalled video. If so, please do click the like button and subscribe for more. I love these early locomotives, so if you liked this video, then I may cover more of them in future. Thanks, as always, to my donors on Ko-fi and Patreon. You are the return flu to my Hackworth boiler. Also, your donations covered the cost of the train fare to Shildon, so extra thanks for that. And I'll see you all again very soon. Cheerio!